Bloomberg Audio Studios. Podcasts, radio, news. You're listening to the Bloomberg Balance of Power podcast. Catch us live weekdays at noon Eastern on Apple CarPlay and Android Auto with the Bloomberg Business app. Listen on demand wherever you get your podcasts or watch us live on YouTube. Welcome to the Monday edition of Balance of Power here on Bloomberg TV and Radio. Indeed, I'm Joe Matthew alongside Kaylee Lines in Washington with something to show for their work, Kaylee. <laughs> the, the bills passed the House and they're headed for the Senate tomorrow, and that includes TikTok. We've spent a lot of time talking about Ukraine and Israel. The divest or ban TikTok bill is part of the so-called sidecar that will all be stitched together here and, and sent to the Senate. I told my 16-year-old over the weekend that it was entirely possible now. They were going to ban TikTok if they couldn't find uh, a buyer. And he did not believe me. He's tired of hearing that. Well, we've heard it repeatedly for some time now. And and to this point, ByteDance's lobbying efforts against any kind of bill that would see it divested or banned were working until I guess maybe they stopped working because (laughs) we now have a piece of legislation that is very likely to pass the Senate and get the signature from President Biden, although there Mm -hmm. is a longer window here for that divestiture. Initially, the bill that first passed the House was six months. Yep. Now they're going to have up to a year. That's right. The question is, does ByteDance use that year to actually try to find a buyer for its U.S. Uh, TikTok arm, or is it just going to use that year fighting this thing out in court? Well, we know that the court's coming. It's a question yep. of whether I guess they try both, because also the Chinese government has to sign off on this as well, That's right? True. We've got a lot of big questions uh, to ask about this. Yes, and we have some of them now for Mike Shepard, who is a senior editor for technology and strategic industries here in Washington and is joining us in studio. So, Mike, if we could first just look at the way that TikTok or ByteDance specifically is likely to respond. Already they're signaling, nope, we're taking this to court. We are not going to go down without a fight, essentially. Yeah, you're right, Kelly. And in fact, they made clear in their statement overnight while we were uh, preparing to get a good night's rest for today <laughs> in this big week of news that they were going to fight this in court pretty much as soon as President Joe Biden signs it, as soon as the ink is dry on his signature. And they are making clear that this fight will be waged on First Amendment grounds, too. They see this as an infringement of uh, people's freedom of expression and also the impact on businesses. There are a lot of small businesses that use TikTok to reach niche audiences of consumers. And so their argument is going to be on the speech grounds and then also on the business grounds as well. So a year uh, is the timeline. Could the legal effort last longer than that? Or maybe a better way of asking it, could the legal effort last longer than November? Because a lot of this is going to key off of who wins this election in terms of the the long game. Well, as we've seen in previous court battles involving companies and politicians and and the government, of course, uh, lawyers have a superpower in being able to drag things out. In fact, if you look at Donald Trump, we've been talking about his legal proceedings. The cases, each of those cases has been kicked down the road to some degree or another. Mm -hmm. And with so much at stake here, and especially given not only the national security grounds that the U.S. government uh, is alleging are at stake in this case, but also the geopolitical and diplomatic stakes with China. Uh, This is a very sensitive case. And so it will be handled carefully by whatever court picks it up. And the lawyers from both sides are going to be looking to, uh, the government may want to move faster, but certainly ByteDance's lawyers will want to take their time. Okay, so it may take a a great deal of time for this to actually play out in court. But in the hypothetical scenario that the U.S. government comes out on top, that ByteDance challenge does not work, and it really is faced with this option of divest or get banned in the U.S., what is that divestiture actually likely to look like? Who is a realistic buyer for a company that could be worth tens of billions of dollars and also could raise antitrust concerns if another tech company were to try to absorb something of that size? And these these are great questions that you're asking here, Kaylee, because the mechanism of the divestiture is going to be incredibly complex, not only in the antitrust grounds. I think, though, we have to back up a little bit because there are a couple of st- steps that we need to clear Mm. before we even get to the point of an actual sale. A, the company would have to agree to it. 
B, the Chinese government would have to sign off, and that they are already making clear that that's a no-go. Mm-hmm. And then even if they do agree to a sale, would that come with the very thing that any sensible buyer would want? And those are the algorithms, mm-hmm. the crown jewels of TikTok, the thing that makes it so good and that makes it work. Now, assuming that's all in there, and I'm highly skeptical that each of these hurdles would be cleared, then you would have to find deep enough pockets to buy this to fend off the antitrust questions, and then somebody be willing to take on the risk. This is a lot of user data, and you have this lingering concern that there might be some still existent connection to China. So it sounds to me like you just outlined the case for a ban. It it may be impossible, if I'm reading you correctly, to find a buyer who could check all of those boxes. Well, if not a, if not a ban, then an outright ban. In other words, you talked about your you, you know your son and yeah. and the interest in keeping TikTok alive and and the uh, inability to suspend disbelief that wait a minute <laughs> the, the, this app that I've come to know and love will go away. <laughs> It could exist, but just not on the app stores. Mm-hmm. Uh, the, the bill would require the app stores to delist it. Mm-hmm. But, you know, kids and users have a way around they these find things. Well, like VPNs. Sure. I mean, how, as someone who had visited China several years ago, and I wanted to be able to use Facebook on my phone. I already had it on my phone. I probably couldn't have downloaded it while in China. Got a VPN. Could use it fine. Worked fine. Basically, this could just make the U.S. with this particular app look a lot like what people have to do in China and using other apps that are banned in China. Kayla, you also brought up another good point, and that is the election. A year from now is a long time. Mm -hmm. Now think about it. If we have a change in administration Mm -hmm. or changes in Congress, we could perhaps see another move to maybe defuse or defang this in some fashion. I'm not saying it's going to happen, but I wouldn't rule out maybe some attempt by the if it becomes a Trump administration that's incoming, mm-hmm. um, they may seek to, uh, to to try to stop this from actually taking effect. Mm-hmm. Remember, Trump was the one who had signed the order initially seeking to ban TikTok. Right. But now, a month ago, he changed his tune. He said he thought the legislation was a bad idea because it would give – in effect, too much to Meta. Uh, right. And of course, he has an axe to grind with Facebook over right. him being banned There's there Jeff after Yass January 6th. Well. Uh-huh. Yes. Not, yeah. not dealing with TikTok on its own <laughs> right, but just don't want to strengthen the other guy right. in this case. You said something important, though, about the crown jewels. That's uh, the algorithm. Let's say Steve Mnuchin or somebody stands up. Let's say it's a patriotic move. They buy this thing for more than it's worth. God knows what's going to happen. But without the special sauce there. This could become a really different product. It could be one that my 16-year-old doesn't care about anymore, right? Because the algorithm is the essence of the business. Well, that's what makes it work. That's what makes it distinctive. Now, somebody like Steve Mnuchin could find a group of investors and technologists to maybe get it pretty close. Uh-huh. Uh, you know, is it, is it close, is it close enough like to Coke Coca-Cola? Right, right, exactly. <laughs> but, you know, people have, you know, there are Coke people and there are Pepsi people. <laughs> and if the TikTok person finds the new flavor just a little bit off mm-hmm. or maybe not serving the purpose that they have in mind, because as I said, there are also businesses mm-hmm. who have been using this to target uh, mm-hmm. their, their audiences. People have very niche businesses. If they make something and, knitting or crochet or makeup or whatever, something maybe related to sports, they have a way, a pathway to that audience of consumers that they have built up over this time. Well, of course, we've all seen the advertisements, I'm sure, part of TikTok's lobbying effort against getting banned with highlighting businesses. I think I saw a beekeeper that made like honey products or soap or (laughs) or something (laughs) like that. There's veterans involved really trying to take their case to the public just as much as to Capitol Hill. Totally. We agree with it or not. Yeah, fair enough. Final mm-hmm. question, just because yeah. you raised the election. Mm-hmm. Regardless of what happens in court or whatever, we're talking a year window in which TikTok will assumably be fully operational, nothing will change. How concerned should we be about the information, misinformation, disinformation that could be propagated on that platform in the run-up to November in the interim? Well, Kelly, when you talk to the proponents of the legislation, that is one of the very reasons that they argue for a ban. They are saying that there's already so much misinformation out there that's uh, skewed and distorted. And in a way, the social media platforms in general have uh, stepped away from any kind of role in being moderators of Mm -hmm. content. They don't want to have to take 
ownership of or responsibility for specific material that could be disinformation. They really just want to say, hey, this is a town square. It's up to you to figure out who you want to trust and who you decide to believe in. And this is, this is the case here with TikTok. But the trouble is, since it does have this foreign tie, mm. you know, the, you talk to national security experts here in this town, many of them will say, be careful. Mm. Great to have you. Uh, in studio with us, Michael. Congratulations on the new title as well. Senior Editor for Technology and Strategic Industries, which means you're going to be spending a lot of time on stories like this one, and we'd love to continue tapping your expertise here on Bloomberg. Great to have Michael Shepard with us as we add the voice of former Ambassador Mark Ginsburg. He spent time as U.S. Ambassador to Morocco, bringing us his geopolitical view, is also now President of the Coalition for a Safer Web, and has a good sense of what we're talking about. Mr. Ambassador, welcome back to Bloomberg. It's good to see you here. We've talked about so many variables. I wonder what your thought is. Assuming this is passed tomorrow and is signed by the president, we then enter a protracted legal battle. How will that end? It's hard to tell. I, I, with the negotiations in Congress, and I worked up on the Hill for seven years, when, it, when this bill originally came to the Senate, the Senate shelved it because there was fear that, the, that TikTok would actually be able to prevail in a constitutional challenge. Uh, it's been tightened up considerably uh, in order to prevail in any TikTok induced constitutional challenge, which because they're surely going to go to court. Uh, at the same time, it's probably not going to take effect for at least a year under the current legislative framework. Uh, there's also an opportunity that this could be subject to a filibuster by Senator Rand Paul. So you have, it's not a sure bet that it's going to breeze its way out of the Senate shortly. Okay, so there still could be fights ahead, whether it's in the Senate or whether it's in the courts moving forward. It does raise the question, though, Mark, of, and we were just speaking with uh, Mike about this. I, I'm not sure if you heard him, Ambassador, but essentially around the idea of the misinformation or disinformation that could be making their way to TikTok users as they continue to use the platform in the run-up to the election. How concerned are you about what's happening in real time, not what could happen a year from now when it's time to either divest or, or get banned? I uh, read the National Director for Intelligence 2022 report on the midterm elections. Uh, that report was probably one of the most important triggers to get a ban on TikTok. Why? Because uh, the N Director of National Intelligence report assessed that ByteDance, the parent of TikTok, was conveying privacy information back up to the Chinese government and that the Chinese government was uh, tailoring the ByteDance TikTok algorithms to interfere in the 2022 midterm election. They got away with it. And if they got away with it in 2022, they're going to try to get away with it in 2024. Uh, as long as TikTok is tied to ByteDance, and the director of national intelligence assesses that that continuation of Chinese government interference in our election is going to remain unimpeded. Uh, I'm all in favor of uh, worrying every hour of every day until 20, the 2024 election is over with what ByteDance and TikTok are up to. Well, we've got a lot to learn here. Obviously, there are questions, Ambassador, about the algorithm. Is it possible uh, to have a, a, a TikTok 2.0 if ByteDance is removed, if the Chinese government is, in fact, removed, and there's an American operator here, could it be the same product? Yeah, uh, listen, uh, algorithms are not necessarily limited by national boundaries. I mean, surely, of course, the particular TikTok algorithm that was developed by ByteDance is proprietary. I don't know whether the Chinese government and ByteDance will permit the sale of those algorithms. They've insisted in any statement that is made on this legislation that they will not permit those algorithms to be conveyed to an org to a uh, private equity firm that uh, Steve Mnuchin, the former Secretary of the Treasury, has claimed that he wants yeah. to gather in order to pur purchase TikTok. Um, can an alternative algorithm be produced in order to substitute for the existing algorithm? Well, there may be a TikTok disruption as a result. Uh, I do believe that mm -hmm. it's not going to be easy to replicate 
the uh, proprietary algorithm as quickly as some people may think. All right, Ambassador, it's always great to have you here on Balance of Power. Too short, but we hope you'll be back soon. That's Ambassador, former U.S. Ambassador to Morocco, Mark Ginsburg. You're listening to the Bloomberg Balance of Power podcast. Catch us live weekdays at noon Eastern on Apple CarPlay and Android Auto with the Bloomberg Business app. You can also listen live on Amazon Alexa from our flagship New York station. Just say, Alexa, play Bloomberg 1130. Washington, Joe, it does seem like there is somewhat of an upbeat mood because something actually got done, at least in one chamber of Congress, <laughs> yeah. as we await the second chamber of no the Senate can believe it. to pass it. But it took months and months and months mm-hmm. for foreign aid to actually pass the House of Representatives, but it has now done so. Well, that's right. We were told by the administration at the end of last year that the window was closing in Ukraine. How they have managed uh, to get by to this extent is frankly a mystery to a lot of folks. Uh, they've been dug in, in in some cases, waiting for artillery for weeks on end. There was a unit we read about last week in Politico that had been waiting for a month for shells to arrive, and now they are going to be sent that way. The question is how quickly uh, that can be done. And again, we'll be talking to uh, Kelly Grieco about that coming up from the Stimson Center, who was with us recently, Kaylee, talking about the run-up now. I'll be curious to hear mm-hmm. her take now that it's actually happened, as I am also curious to hear from Jack Fitzpatrick, our appropriations expert, <laughs> had a working weekend following the ball here on four bills that are going to be now stitched together into one and sent uh, to the Senate. All the while, we're wondering what happens to the Speaker of the House. He's at Bloomberg Government, Jack Fitzpatrick. Great to see you. Probably feels like Wednesday or something to you at this point. Um, Mike Johnson has a couple of days, I guess, to breathe. When lawmakers return next week, is there in fact going to be a motion to vacate? The, the, the lawmakers who have signed on to one seem to think that they're going to force him to resign. Why in the world would he do that? I don't think he would. Uh, it does seem that Marjorie Taylor Greene is not backing down. She says that she's going ahead with forcing a vote on this motion to vacate. She's been tweeting about it. Yeah. Uh, it doesn't seem like a major danger for Johnson. It's been a while now that we've heard that there are Democrats who don't want to see him ousted over allowing a vote on Ukraine aid. So there are a few hardline members who certainly unless they back down are going to force a vote but it's not as tough a situation for johnson as it was for mccarthy Mm -hmm. uh i I think there's some fatigue with the palace intrigue and the politicking on the house floor that dominated people's attention for so long uh and and democrats don't want to punish the speaker for allowing a vote on a bill that they liked Mm -hmm. well we certainly have heard from democrats on this very program congressman ami bear of california adam smith of washington who also expressed that (laughs) essentially that they think the speaker did the right thing here so why would they not protect him so i guess maybe that is why it will turn out differently for Mike Johnson than Kevin McCarthy. I want to ask you, though, just around this idea in the Senate, because we're all kind of operating under this, that this could happen quickly. It's going to pass. Mm -hmm. Yet we know it's the U.S. Senate, and if you don't have unanimous consent, things can move slowly. Any one one senator could be disruptive. Are we going to face that potentially around amendment votes and the like? Less than we normally would. Because congressional leadership was on board and... Uh, put things in the rule in the House and package this in a way that kind of expedites it. Usually it takes, uh, if you don't have unanimous consent in the Senate, it can take about a week to pass something. Mm -hmm. That's probably cut in half or even less because they packaged this into a bill that had previously been uh, taken up in the Senate. There's no work to do on the motion to proceed. I could talk for an hour about the, (laughs) the procedural aspect of this. Long story short, if a lot of people want to slow this down, Mm -hmm. It could be a 30-hour delay between voting to limit debate and then passing it, but that's not nearly as bad as if it could take a week, which is usually what can happen. So they don't really need unanimous consent. Congressional leadership worked together so that this is going to get the initial procedural vote tomorrow. It might be late tomorrow, or it might take until Wednesday to actually pass it. It's not entirely clear. But this is not going to drag on throughout the week like Rand Paul at one point had mm-hmm. threatened. Safe to say the majority of senators want to get out of town and get yeah. their recess started. So what's most likely at some point on Wednesday we wrap this up? If not late Tuesday, it could be late Tuesday. It could stretch into Wednesday. Uh, One person can still slow it down, 
but if the if a lot of members don't want to take up their time to debate, we're probably talking much less than the 30 hour period. So okay. either Tuesday or Wednesday, mm -hmm. and this does seem to clearly have the votes. They voted previously on a foreign aid package already. Yeah. Uh, this yeah. all facets that of this. That was 70, if I remember. 70 for that. So all we'll of clear. these got more than 300 votes in the House. So it looks good in the Senate. Could it lose some votes though because the TikTok divestiture ban? divest or ban has been included. That, that is one of the most interesting parts of this because the packaging of this was more about the political question of do the hawks stand together, do the neoconservatives stand together and do some do what they want. And this was sort of a, a hawkish packaging of things. The TikTok ban doesn't really have anything to do with Ukraine aid. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, but this came together as essentially a show of political willpower by the Republican hawks, the governing wing. It, it all fit together politically, so I don't think mm -hmm. that would necessarily lose a lot of support in the Senate. All right, Jack Fitzpatrick, who covers Congress for Bloomberg government, thank you so much as always. Certainly we're all going to keep an eye on the Senate over the course of the next day or two to see when this thing actually can head to the president for a signature. And we know the president of Ukraine certainly is waiting for it. He talked this weekend on NBC's Meet the Press. Here he is. This aid will strengthen Ukraine. We did lose the initiative there. Now we have all the chance to stabilize the situation and to uh, overtake the initiative. And we want to get more on how exactly this will help Ukraine and how quickly with Kelly Grieco. She is senior fellow with the Reimagining U.S. Grand Strategy Program at the Stimson Center. Kelly, it's always great to have you here on Balance of Power. What is your assessment of just how fast this aid could change the situation on the ground for Ukraine? Well, thank you for having me. Um, I think, and, you know, I, I think there's two parts to that answer, which is one, I think within a few days, once it passes the Senate, certain critical things like artillery can probably be delivered to Ukraine, though it might take longer for Ukraine to distribute that within the country. And then other systems that are stateside um, will take longer to be able to deliver again. Uh, to Ukraine, but it will, you know, it, it will be weeks to months probably before it has a very significant effect. That sounds like a painfully long wait. Uh, if you're an under-resourced Ukrainian soldier in the field, uh, Kelly, how much of this will go to uh, weapons or equipment that has yet to be made? We've all been learning about the defense industrial base over the course of this debate. And I know that much of the weaponry still needs to be actually manufactured. So will this be rolled out over the course of the rest of this year? Yes, I mean, th this is exactly the challenge, right? Um, is that there's funding, but you need to be able to buy something. Uh, and a lot of these things have, as you said, not been made. And many of these high valued systems that are in low quantity, like Patriot missiles, um, have also been promised to other countries. So one of the issues that needs to be addressed is where the priority is going to be in terms of Ukraine, um, perhaps sending more of those missiles that were intended for others to Ukraine, and that still needs to be worked out. Um, so that's certainly going to take time. Well, and as we consider time, Kelly, it also raises the question of how far $60 billion in aid goes in a conflict like this before more aid might be needed if there's no real end in sight. Is this money going to bring us closer to the end of this war or just prolong it further because it gives Ukraine longer to have a fighting chance. Yes, so this is really where I'm the most concerned because I supported, you know, providing Ukraine with more aid, particularly for artillery that it desperately needs and the United States is able to provide. But I think you're asking the right question, which is we need to start thinking really seriously about long-term strategy here and pivoting from a talk about liberating all Ukrainian territory and militarily defeating Russia to how do we create a credible, sustainable defense for Ukraine, because this is a war of attrition and it's stalemated and bringing it to the negotiating table. It goes back to what Mark Milley, General Mark Milley said about a year ago when he was still chairman of the chiefs of uh, the Joint Chiefs Staff, which is that this is a war that's going to end in negotiations. And so we really need to start be thinking about what is the strategy to get there. Well, that's awfully important then. A little more on that, uh, Kelly. What would that look like? You just got $60 billion here. You've got a finite amount of time to work with it. How does Ukraine deploy that money in a way that would, in fact, strengthen its hand 
at the negotiating table. I'm guessing that's a strategy of its own. Does it need to start punching through Russian lines? Does it take down the bridge to Crimea? Is, is there something specific that would help? Yeah, I think actually it really needs to focus on defensive systems and defensive fortifications. So if you think about when it, Ukraine went it on its own counteroffensive, um, you know, which failed, it was partly because Russia had devised really dense, thick defenses, fortifications. So anti-tank obstacles, um, well-defended trenches. And so Ukraine is starting to do that but it's months behind in its preparation. And I think that's actually one of the areas where we could really help is sending some of those capa some of that capability, some of the, the you know, concrete, um, the construction equipment, not just advanced, mm -hmm. you know, missiles and artillery. And I think though it really is about a long change change shift in perspective, you know, already. As soon as as soon as it passed, this bill passed, you started hearing, you know, talk about 2025, Ukraine returning to the counteroffensive. And, you know, we don't want to repeat Groundhog Day here um, and waste mm -hmm. sort of this capability going on a very costly counteroffensive that's unlikely to succeed. So I think it's coming to terms with the reality that Ukraine should focus first and foremost on holding the territory that it has. Well, Kelly, when we think about a potential future counteroffensive, it really just brings us back to the idea of the force that Ukraine is trying to counter, which is Russia. How is Russia likely to respond knowing more assistance is coming Ukraine's way? Does it change what they will do in real time in the interim and potentially make this a more dangerous moment for Ukraine while they wait for everything to arrive to them? Yeah, I mean, it's clear the Kremlin's not happy. They've you know issued their usual kind of statements indicating um, uh, indicating that. It does create a window for Moscow in terms of how it's thinking about launching an offensive, um, which is expected this spring and summer, and that it might be thinking now that it has a window of a few weeks to a few months to try to do that when Ukraine is at its maximum vulnerability. Um, and that's possible. I don't know, though, if the Russians are really capable of being that agile to speed things up. They haven't really shown that during the course of the war. Um, but I think the real issue here is that Russia thought its strategy was that it could outlast Western support, including U.S. support for Ukraine. And this mm -hmm. is certainly sending a signal that that strategy is not working. And so the I hope I have is that there will be more pressure on both sides of this conflict to head to a negotiating table. And there's supposed to be some kind of, um, you know, Diplom diplomatic effort in June in Switzerland. And I'd like to see both parties actually um, attending that and, and really working towards some kind of settlement. Spending time with Kelly Grieco uh, from the Stimson Center following the passage of Ukraine funding in the House and the expected passage of Ukraine funding uh, in the Senate. Should Joe Biden go back? And I ask you that because morale has been as much of an issue as equipment and materiel. So of troops, by the way, uh, Kelly, in our remaining moment, I'd love for you to focus on that, whether or not the president should be there again. This does not buy more manpower for Ukraine. What does it do about the issue of bodies on yeah. the battlefield? Yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, this is Ukraine's war, and that includes um, man manpower, as you suggest. And Ukraine took months um, trying to pass a bill to lower the recruitment age. I don't think that Biden is actually all that important a visit from him in terms of morale. I think, you know, Ukraine um, has to do that itself. And they have been very determined. And that's something I think for their leadership to, to work out. It's great to have you back, Kelly. Stimson Center Senior Fellow with the Reimagining uh, U.S. Grand Strategy Program. Kelly Grieco, thanks for joining, as always, here on Balance of Power. Uh, it's going to be pretty quick from here. It sure seems like after mm -hmm. what we just heard in the last 10 minutes here, Kaylee, there's going to be an agreement likely on debate in the Senate. This could be done tomorrow. We could be talking about a law by Wednesday morning. Yeah, I guess if all the timing works out and mm -hmm. President Biden would very likely give its signature to that bill almost sure. immediately after we know that the president did speak with Vladimir Zelensky today, underscoring the U.S.'s lasting commitment to supporting Ukraine. But just because this passed, Joe, there is still the question of how much more lasting that commitment will be as this conflict potentially goes on well into the future. That's for sure. And uh, it sounds like the narrative is going to be very quickly coalescing around an end game here, the negotiating table and how this money can help them get there. With Kaylee Lines, I'm Joe Matthew. The panel's next on Bloomberg. 
You're listening to the Bloomberg Balance of Power podcast. Catch us live weekdays at noon Eastern on Apple CarPlay and Android Auto with the Bloomberg Business app. Listen on demand wherever you get your podcasts or watch us live on YouTube. Kaylee Lines and Joe Matthew are here in Washington checking on whether Marjorie Taylor Greene seems to have changed her mind yet <laughs> about whether she thinks Mike Johnson should keep his job as House Speaker. Well, as of an hour ago, Joe, it does not seem not so. Her up. latest post on X, yeah. Mike Johnson still hasn't shown Congress or the American people the proof that Russia intends to invade the rest of Europe after finishing its campaign in Ukraine. It goes on for a few more sentences and ends with, we need a new speaker, two exclamation points. Okay. The refrain, though, over the weekend from Marjorie Taylor Greene, Tom Massey, mm-hmm. is that they wanted him to resign, that they would ratchet up the pressure until Mike Johnson had no other option Yep. but to leave on his own. And of course, Kaylee, he already articulated last week the words, I will not resign, <laughs> leading us to doubt that as a viable option. But they could pull the trigger on this. He could still lose his job. And so we may as well dive in there with the panel, right? Sounds good. Rick Davis and Jeannie Shanzano are with us, Bloomberg Politics contributors. Uh, I have to apologize to both of you in advance. I really don't want to do this to you every day, but it's hanging out there, uh, Jeannie. What are we going to do about the motion to vacate or should Mike Johnson resign? That does seem to be what the three Republicans who have their name on this believe. All the while, some are arguing he's more powerful now that he got these bills passed. What do you think? Yeah, he seems to have found the secret sauce, which is, you know, 100 percent Democrats, 50 percent or so Republicans, and he can pretty much pass anything there. Um, the you know, recipe, I, okay. I think yeah, it's probably not what the Marjorie Taylor Greens of the world want to hear. But, you know, I, I think as it pertains to his job, number one, who wants it? Number two, you know, I think he's probably safe until November. Um, it depends, obviously, on what happens in the election. And I've never thought he had a real shot at keeping the job next year. I, in fact, think that's more likely now than I did before. But I think for the moment, he's probably safe. That doesn't mean she can't move forward on the motion to vacate. But I think we're hearing enough Democrats who would be there to support him. And that would keep him safe at least until probably November. Rick, when we think about Mike Johnson staying safe, especially if the cost of staying safe is having Democrats step in to help you, is he safe with no real power? You keep the gavel, but your ability to wield it for your own purposes is kind of not really there because... You need Democrats to do anything, and your own party has members that really would not like you to be in the job. I just wonder how we think about what safe is for Mike Johnson. Well, there's really nothing safe about ever being a speaker. So the whole concept of safety (laughs) is not really relevant to politics in general, because you never know what shifting alliances are going to occur. And of course, you know, in this day and age, when you have such a divided country that's extremely well represented in almost a completely divided House of Representatives, um, you know, there's no place to hide. There is no safe place. And so I think that the Band-Aid has been ripped off. I mean, you know, you now have a coalition government in the House of Representatives, uh, and that coalition government will probably stick together between now and the election because there's nothing new to happen, right? They can just band together and pass whatever they want. And frankly, the things that would get passed probably find ready acceptance with the president and with the Senate. So they could actually be a more productive uh, House of Representatives between now and Election Day, even when usually that's when people shut down and they go home to campaign. So it's an odd upside down world we live in, and it's currently being well represented (laughs) by the House. So uh, my guess is there's no fear at all of Marjorie Taylor Greene. Uh, This motion to vacate will be tabled almost immediately. And so the idea that they have any leverage over Mike Johnson um, is uh, a fantasy. So uh, I think we're going to see the rest of this Congress be a bipartisan year in the House of Representatives. Certainly not where we thought when we started this year. Well, God knows it's not then, Jeannie. Is there a way for Joe Biden to leverage a so-called coalition government here on Capitol Hill uh, to maybe sneak something through in a campaign year that could make a difference beyond what's just happened? 
Yeah, you know, I don't know that I that I would believe that in a Congress which has passed what sixty nine or so bills, one of the lowest in history, yeah. that in you know months before an election, the president of the opposition party could pass through much. I mean, it's possible, but I think Joe Biden has got to be very happy with what happened over the weekend, and quite frankly, what he has been able to accomplish in this Congress because. It has been, you know, I think against all odds that he has gotten through what he's gotten through. So he's got to be happy. He's moving on the campaign trail. You know, I, I do think we may see a little, um, you know, a little dust up in the Senate with some of this, you know, as they move forward. I think they're going to move quickly on this. But I think it's fascinating. People like Mike Lee trying to force an amendment that ensures that Ukraine pays back this money. I mean, the the sort of... Um, parts of this that we're hearing, there's not just, you know, inter-party fighting in the House. It's also in the Senate. You know, you look at J.D. Vance and, and uh, Lindsey Graham. So mm -hmm. I think there may be a little conversation there in the next 24 hours or so, but they want to get out this weekend. So I think they're going to, I mean, this week rather. So I think they're going to pass this pretty quickly if they can. Yeah, I guess the difference maybe, Rick, would be that in the Senate, the Republican infighting is in the minority where you didn't have that much power anyway versus in the House. It's in the majority, which has rendered the majority a little less useful, perhaps, than a, a typical majority would be. I just wonder, given everything we've seen and what you were just speaking to, the idea that something did pass, it was in a bipartisan way, which probably is what the majority of the American people would like to see. Have the Republicans improved their odds of being able to retain the House in November, especially if we don't see another chaotic go around for a new speaker because Mike Johnson gets kicked out? Yeah. Uh, last first. Yes. I think this last week has been a step in the right direction for members, especially in the more swing districts who can go back and say, hey, I got Ukraine funding. I got funding for our allies in Asia and the Middle East. Uh, and uh, there'll be some explaining to do about the TikTok ban. But other than that, I think that <laughs> The reality is this is this is actually going to be helpful to Republican members going home. And it's not that it's not helpful to Democrats, but I think it's a good incumbency racket to have passed this bill. I think that's why you saw so many members of Congress being for this, because it's good politics and it's good for the country. That being said, I mean, I, I think we have to get away from this whole idea that anybody in the House has leverage. It's going to be you know, sort of like, you know, whatever coalition you can bring to bear. And with one vote margin of majority, that concept of a majority is kind of thrown out the window. So getting things done like the farm bill and the FAA reauthor, these are big things, right? I mean, that have been stymied. You couldn't even get a rule for any of this stuff in the past. Now you're going to have Democrats in a rules committee voting regularly to get things out <laughs> now that they've gotten it done once. Why not do it more often? So I think it completely wow. changes the dynamic in the House of Representatives. It's like a different chamber now than it was a week ago. And and maybe for the positives for you know American taxpayers. It's a different chamber. I'm going to have to start watching these Rules Committee uh, hearings to see what Chip Roy does in the face of this coalition government. Uh, Jeannie, lastly, Joe Biden is uh, talking about Earth Day today. He's going to be campaigning again this week while Donald Trump is in and out of court. I presume it helps him uh, from the uh, making good on promises file here to say that we are standing by our allies. I got this across the finish line. Is that enough to make up for all the young people who are going to be angry with him and with Democrats about TikTok? You know, I, I don't know if it's enough to make up for it. And I think the anger amongst young people, and we see it just in, you know, the NBC poll out, I think it was yesterday. Um, it's a big yeah. problem for him. And the biggest challenge there has to do with what's going on in Israel. So, you know, I'm not sure the passage of this bill helps him with that constituency. And it's something he really needs to work on because the numbers are really problematic as it pertains to enthusiasm amongst that group. And so, you know, he can talk about this success, but I'm not sure it's a message he would want to take to college campuses, quite frankly, at this point. Mm -hmm. All right, Rick, 
Davis and Jeannie Shanzano, our Bloomberg Politics contributors. Thank you very much. And of course, Joe, college campuses is where we see kind of an overlap in this Venn diagram in many ways. On the one hand, you have a lot of people who are getting news and information from TikTok. There has been a lot of conversation as to whether or not there is a pro-Palestinian bent in some of that content they will see. And of course, you're seeing like what we're seeing at Columbia, Mm -hmm. where they've had to move classes online. Because yep. of the goings on of the last several days. Uh, and again, the White House stepping in to condemn yeah. what's happening on a college campus. It's pretty remarkable uh, what's happening there. Whether TikTok ends up being banned, though, you know, this may not be answered even during this campaign cycle if mm-hmm. we enter this protracted legal challenge that we're hearing about. By the way, Bloomberg Intelligence, we love talking to the analysts at BI about they're running odds on this, Kaylee. Yeah. And they say 70 percent odds the government wins a legal challenge by TikTok that it will, in fact, go through the legislature and the courts. Well, and then it becomes a question, what does TikTok do then? Mm -hmm. Or specifically, what does ByteDance do? Do they agree then to the divestiture? Do they hold on to the algorithm, though, which would make maybe the whole thing worth a lot less than it would be? Otherwise, there are so many remaining questions, and we're going to be digging a lot more into this. You're listening to the Bloomberg Balance of Power podcast. Catch us live weekdays at noon Eastern on Apple CarPlay and Android Auto with the Bloomberg Business app. You can also listen live on Amazon Alexa from our flagship New York station. Just say, Alexa, play Bloomberg 1130. As we get ourselves back to business on a Monday, welcome to Balance of Power on the radio, on the satellite, and on YouTube. Amazing what can happen. If we put our minds to it, a busy weekend in the House of Representatives. It was so busy, it might mean the end of the speakership, depending on who you ask. But they're pretty happy in Ukraine because the money is coming. We still have to go through the Senate. The president's got to sign it. But all of that appears to be uh, kind of the easy part here. Getting through the House was the tough one. Aid for Ukraine, while you were enjoying your weekend, passes 311 to 112. Aid for Israel, 366 to 58. Tomorrow is when they get to it in the Senate. The president's waiting to intercept this. By the way, they're going to fast track this thing in the Senate because they're already over time on starting their recess. And that's going to work, of course, for everybody. And then they'll come back for the White House correspondence dinner, presumably, or at least those who get invited. Tom Massey, who signed on to the motion to vacate, along with Marjorie Taylor Greene, These were the original two. Like Marjorie Taylor Greene, he is now calling for the resignation of Mike Johnson. But if if it comes to it, he says, a vote will be called, referring to the MTV. And it is unclear today. Of course, they're all gone now on recess. What's going to happen when they come back? Or if maybe Mike Johnson is suddenly a made man because he's got Democrats on his side, at least at the moment. Kate Ackley will help us with all of this. She was covering it over the weekend, spoke with her on Friday going into the votes, and she's with us now from Bloomberg government. Kate, it's great to see you. Does Mike Johnson have to worry this morning, or does he know that the other party will be there for him? I don't know if he can know that the other party is going to be there for him. He has shored up a lot of support, even among his own you know, Republicans. He has, you know, gotten this Ukraine aid, Israel aid, also that TikTok mm-hmm. bill, all that, they cleared that all on Saturday and it sent it as a, you know, sort of bundled it up in a package, sent it over to the Senate. And the Senate is poised to move on it this week. It looks like that's going to get to the president's desk, you know, this week. So, um, you know, definitely he has done the things that People like Marjorie Taylor Greene said, you know, if you do this, we're, it's going to trigger yeah. this uh, this motion um, to vacate. I, you know, I mean, there are a lot of people who were acting like, you know, last Thursday, Friday, that Mike Johnson was, you know, essentially kind of a, a, a dead speaker walking, if you will, who now think he mm-hmm. has more support, including from Democrats. You know, it's really hard to predict um, how this will all shake out. I, I mean, how long is he going to be speaker? Who knows? Because, you know, after the November elections, Republicans could lose the House anyway, and then there's no Republican speaker at all. So it's it's not maybe like he has real long term job security, if you will. It's that kind of job. Uh, but but yeah. he's going to last through this week because they're in recess. <laughs> That's right. He's at least got a week to think about things. Uh, Kate, we should talk about uh, what was 
actually accomplished here. It's not just funding for Ukraine and Israel, both of which were controversial in their respective quarters. But TikTok passed, divest or ban, and it's going to the Senate now. That was something that we thought would fail in the Senate if it ever got a vote. Now senators are faced with a choice. If you don't like TikTok, that means you have to vote against Israel and Ukraine. So this is seen as a done deal here, correct? All of this in one piece should pass the Senate, assuming they can have a deal to end debate. Yes, I, I exactly. I mean, this. we thought that the TikTok measure was going to at least be very slowed down in the Senate, if not completely stopped. This has a little bit of a change. It gives a uh, longer time. You know, the I think the initial bill was like six months where TikTok mm-hmm. would have to divest from ByteDance. It's, uh, you know, foreign owned parent company. This gives a little bit more time, potentially. Um, TikTok has been saying and, you know, as, as Bloomberg has been reporting that it will, you know, TikTok ByteDance will fight this um, if this is yeah. enacted, will fight it in the courts. Uh, saying that it, you know, is not legal, um, constitutional. So it's maybe not the end here, but this is a huge setback for TikTok. It's kind of amazing. You specialize in covering lobbyist money. Kate, is this going to be another free-for-all? Is there anything lobbyists can do at this point, or is it all in the courts? I mean, people usually, companies usually will have a, strategy in tandem, courts, you know, litigation, lobbying, you know, anything you can signal, even if you get just a bill introduced on something or, or, you know, get members of Congress to talk about something that can certainly help help with a court case. Um, Mm -hmm. So these are often things that go in tandem. I don't think that TikTok would abandon a congressional strategy, a legislative strategy, and just only pursue, you know, a litigation strategy. But it certainly looks like unless something and I don't think it's going to happen. I mean, something really changed dramatically that this TikTok ban or divest bill does look like it's on the fast track this week. There you have Kate Ackley. It's great to see you, Kate. I hope you didn't work the entire weekend, but good to have you with us here on Balance of Power reporting for Bloomberg government passing the House. We're now waiting on the Senate. And then, of course, the president probably won't be able to sign this fast enough when that likely happens. But I want to get back to the matter of the speaker, Mike Johnson, who's got, as we have already indicated, some time to think about things. And so do the three Republican lawmakers who have uh, filed this motion to vacate that, by the way, is still not privileged. This is still just a threat hanging over his head. And it's an important thing to remember here, uh, knowing that this could, in fact, be a problem for Mike Johnson when he returns. Lisa Camuso Miller knows what it's like to work in the speaker's office and the many complexities that come with this, particularly in this case, for someone with no experience in the higher echelons of leadership. She was also, of course, communications director for the RNC, and she's host of the Friday Reporter podcast now, Lisa Camuso Miller. Great to see you. You have a sense of what Mike Johnson is facing. Do you believe the threat? Because I feel like I could ask you today fairly. Is he weaker or more strengthened by what happened over the weekend? So I am I am really amazed at how much he has come to accomplish. I feel like I'm in the camp that he is stronger today than he has ever been. Uh, I know that there are these outside threats that have been offered, but can you imagine how politically unpopular it would be for the Republicans in the House to now go back through, try to remove the speaker again and have another fight for another leader just six months before election day. I can think of nothing less popular to do. And this package of of legislation that will now go to the Senate is in support Mm -hmm. of our allies and a vote against our enemies, which is China, which ultimately is the fight that we're having over TikTok. And the speaker did it in a way where he did it over with coalition, like a coalition of bipartisanship in a way that has not happened. Uh, It to me is one of those things where He is showing signs of leadership in the absence of leadership in a place that is very difficult to govern right now. And so to me, it just feels like everything he has promised to do has been delivered and delivered in a way that while it's been slower, everybody knows that the House Republican conference has been incredibly difficult to govern. 
And he's done it in a way that I think it ought to be lauded and ought to be people ought to be proud of. The thing is that very coalition you talk about is why Marjorie Taylor Greene wants him to be gone. They they don't want a Republican speaker who's working with Democrats. I think it was uh, Andy Biggs. Forgive me if I'm getting the, la- the the wrong Freedom Caucus member here who referred to uh, essentially a coalition government last week. If Democrats protect him in a motion to vacate, could that in fact be his undoing when it comes to perception within his own conference? Perhaps, but there's also a risk that this co- this uh, small faction of unhappy all the time Republican members of the conference uh, could also find themselves with, with uh, Congressman Jeffries, Leader Jeffries as their speaker, which would mm-hmm. really be unpopular for them too. So there's all kinds of factions that are in place here, Joe, all kinds of uh, small things that are happening. It's, it surprises me how much power this small coalition of Freedom Conference folks um, have over the the overall Republican conference. So to me, it feels as if if governing is the priority of the House of Representatives, then it's in the best interest of the Republicans and the Democrats to keep things as they are so that we can keep proceeding and go home in November and celebrate the wins that we've had. Republicans and Democrats will obviously celebrate those wins. But if Republicans continue to meddle with progress in government, it will be detrimental to their success in November. I want you to bring us inside the speaker's office here, Lisa. You worked for uh, Speaker Dennis Hastert. And I recall a tweet by Tom Massey last week in which he said the speaker now shares procedural power with the Democrats. How do you take that line? Because you know what it's like to sit in the speaker's office and strategize and talk about uh, whipping votes and moving an agenda here. Does Hakeem Jeffries actually play a role in that starting now? I'm not so sure about that. Um, I do think, though, that we are governing with one seat majority. That is very Mm -hmm. different from the time when I was in the majority. We had a, a wide berth. We had an opportunity where folks could make a little bit more of a, uh, a personal to their their own district decisions, while also voting almost always with the leadership. Nowadays, we're in a place where if we expect to keep our allies close and support folks like Israel and Ukraine and make decisions about how not to do business with China, we are very much going to have to work with others on the other side of the aisle, regardless of our differences in policies, because some of these policies, as much as we want to play politics all the time, are more about country than they are about party. And that to me, even though it's making some of these hardliners very unhappy, it is definitely still, to me, a way to govern and lead. And that's when I was in leadership. That's what we were looking to do, show leadership. In fact, Speaker Hastert used to say he is a speaker for the entire House of Representatives. He was elected by his peers, but he was elected to lead. And that, to me, is something that I'm seeing in this speaker in an unconventional way. Sure, yeah, he's got to work with Democrats. Does he want to do it? Probably no. But does he want to govern? Does he want to be perceived as someone who can work and make change? I think that's absolutely his priority. Well, so what does he do at this moment then, Lisa, or what can he do? Because every time he walks around a corner, Donald Trump is going to be standing there. And I think we can argue that Donald Trump helped him survive last week, giving him cover after he went to Mar-a-Lago. And he's trying to keep things together here to avoid a speaker battle, knowing that that could be a problem for Republicans up and down the ticket, all the way up to the top of the ticket in his case. Is Mike Johnson capable of doing anything to coalesce around a certain group and actually activate an agenda here? Or is he just waiting for the phone to ring from Mar-a-Lago? Well, I think it's hard to say. I think Donald Trump, regardless of where you stand on Donald Trump, I think he does. He really wants to win in November. And I think that the people around him know how to win elections. And they know that having success And having opportunities to point to supporting smart policies that people back home are are activated about is the right way to Mm -hmm. go. And having these petty discussions and arguments about who should be in charge is not the path to success in November. And Donald Trump has seen that and he has said that. And I've heard from, from friends of mine that are closer into that circle that he is unhappy 
with this constant back and forth. He wants to see leadership. He wants to see something that he can stand on to say Republicans know how to govern in spite of the fact that there's a Democrat in the White House and the and the Democrats are controlling the Senate. So that to me seems so like if it's that's Donald the Trump's, end of the story, then it doesn't matter what Marjorie Taylor Greene thinks as long as Donald no. Trump does not want his campaign to be interrupted. Mike Johnson is a safe man. He's got the speaker's gavel. I really think so, Joe. That says a lot to us as we work our way through the next six months. Can he get anything passed in that environment? Well, I don't know. This was kind of an amazing weekend for him. <laughs> I think that it all remains to be seen. I think there's a lot of work that's still yet to be done, but also to keeping those factions as close as they can, keeping them working together. I mean, it, there was so much that was set in, in, in a pathway starting in January from the, the one vote to motion to vacate the Senate or the, the speaker mm -hmm. to putting two hardliners on the rules committee. It has made the speaker's office so much less powerful that it, yeah. If nothing else, he can point to these as wins and point to these as ways that perhaps they can work together as a com conference to get more done. Um, but well, doing I'm glad you could talk to us today about it. Lisa Camusa Miller. It's great to have you back, Lisa. Thanks for listening to the Balance of Power podcast. Make sure to subscribe if you haven't already at Apple, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. And you can find us live every weekday from Washington, D.C. at noontime Eastern at Bloomberg.com.